You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Your host, Ken Lane. We're here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. We've got a lot in store for you. I'm starting to see the leading indicators of spring's coming. So here we're a few weeks out. So usually mid-February to March 1 is when true spring, I mean, daffodils start to bloom. Daffodils start to come up and elongate. Your winter-blooming jasmines, camellias are all in bloom. Rhododendrons, azaleas will start blooming. And then it just flows right from there. A lot of that has to do with the weather. So this week we had a storm. That's great. We needed that. A very wet, heavy snow. That is perfect. We're going to go deep this show as far as how to put wildflowers in. If you had put your wildflower seeds on the ground right before that snow came, oh, that would have been the best thing that's like the stars aligned and everything happened. And we'll, we'll tell you why. We're going to go all things flowering by seed. So this is your season for putting wildflowers in in the ground. But you need to know a few things. We want to go deep on that. Uh, we're holding the class next weekend. What is that? The 26th, I think, on how to actually a demonstration. Here's how you do wildflowers. That's it. I'm going to give you here on this show just some of the insider scoops on how to pull that off. Do a lot of Q&A. Uh, what are other people talking about? And then we'll get Lisa's perspective on things. There's a lot in store this week. This this week, I actually noticed I did a lot of gardening this week outdoors right before that storm came. It's really great. Perfect. Got most of my pruning finished. I've got the front yard, a few more Russian sage, and a few more salvia gregii's or autumn sages to prune back. And those are two varieties. If you don't prune heavily on those two plants, I would say butterfly bush is the same way. Uh, you, you, they'll take over the yard. They'll reseed, come up everywhere. They get woody, real thick, barky on the inside, and they stop blooming. Look, they lose their luster. They stop having as much flower. So it's important to prune things back this time of year, the midwinter, uh, to, to encourage them to flush new growth. Uh, the, these are plants that they have their best flowers when they're blooming on new wood. So if you've got a brand new stalk that comes up from the crown or from that base of that plant, it elongates up two, three, four feet, and then it flowers. You'll get better, more vibrant, more fragrant flowers out of that. If it's if it starts to bloom on old wood, thick, crusty wood, first of all, the bark gets so thick on some plants that the new leaf buds and flower buds can't push their way through the, the bark. Seems counterintuitive, but literally that's what happens. So they get old and crusty, and you can just look at them. They look like twigs instead of lush, vibrant foliage and flowers. So this is especially important for, again, that Russian sage, the butterfly bush, the, uh, I would say, uh, autumn sage or salvia gregii, say crepe myrtles. There's all, especially those summer blooming plants. This is really critical. So the way I go into that is I'll go down at the base and I just, I start with what are the biggest, thickest um, uh, pr- uh, branches coming up from the base. And so I go for those. By the time I get done, it, it just gets so much easier at that point. And I'll get them back down to about knee high or so. Right now, my Russian sage are standing uh, maybe hip high, maybe three, three and a half feet tall. And I'm using the dwarf varieties. I would never plant a standard size Russian sage. This is a very aggressive bush. I don't want something that's that robust in my yard. It's too much maintenance for me. That's just me. Uh, So I I strategically go for dwarf varieties when I can, uh, but I want the color as well by that street. And there's quite a number of them. If you go by our house, you go, whoa, look at all that blue. Then in front of that, stepping down, I've got a red salvia. So you get this, this stair step of wall of red, wall of purple. Then behind that, it's got evergreen junipers that I've strate- strategically planted uh, behind those to give me this walled courtyard, private garden feel, even at the front of my house. 
Yes, neighbors can go by and wave in between the pillars of green junipers, but they're they're too busy looking at gawking over all the color that's out there. So, but I'm I'm finishing up that pruning. I did an exceptional amount of gardening this week, just because the storm was coming. So I want it was it was dry and easy to get around. I was pruning back my perennials with a lawnmower. I actually dragged my corded, my kind of electric lawnmower that I use in the front yard. I dragged it down a flight of stairs to the backyard, and I just mow back my iris, all my ornamental grasses, uh, uh, mums, asters, basically anything that was a perennial back there. My strawberry bed. I took the lawnmower over it. It was easier than a weed whacker getting on my hands and knees and trying to print back. And it just and I just remulch all that stuff. Now in my backyard, this this is a great way to go because I compost right directly on the ground and so and I and I spread some cedar bark over top of that. So it just adds to the organics in the backyard. So to recycle recycling it works great. If you don't have that, you've got more uh, rock lawn and things planted in there or beds of things or islands of plants, then you might use a weed whacker or something. You can always blow it off and things. But I, the secret is I got in right before that, that storm hit and I was spending one last day. And I guess I ought to mention this. I don't want to mention this, but it seems like I should because the, the outcry has been so kind and so generous. The RSVPs, the, you know, the, 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 I don't even know where to go with that. My, we lost our dog this week. And so Bailey, Bailey May, a Scotty, she was the ultimate garden companion. She loved being in the backyard with me. So she loves, now Scotties, if you know terriers, they love to dig. They love to find gophers. They love to bury bones. They just love to dig and be in the garden and get dirty. And they're just right there. Basically, Scotties are are dust mops, really. They get this long coat that picks up everything. So by the time she gets done, she's got mowed down perennials on her coat. She's got leaves hanging from her from her snout. It's hilarious. But she loves being in the garden. And so we knew she was she had cancer. So we knew we had to help her before she got in any more pain. So we had an appointment on Thursday with Prescott Animal Hospital. You folks are so kind. Thank you uh, to all the staff, technicians, and doctors um, that helped us with that through that process. They've got such a great, classy new hospital there, private rooms where you can just have this last moment with your garden pet. I mean, this guy, this day, this is, she was our lives. And we loved hanging out together. We spent one last day in the yard together, just, just she and I. And Vincent, our lab. Of course, he's oblivious. Labs are always oblivious until they find a ball. They're going, hey, you want to play? And so the bay, the uh, the Scotty and I were out there digging, pruning, uh, get, getting things going. Just we had this intimate moment together, and then um, we let her go on Thursday. So it's been a hard, hard thing. I posted that on Facebook. In fact, I wrote a poem. I should pull that up. I'll, I'll see if I can. I'm a poet. I like, I like writing poetry. It's my release. And so when I wrote this, I just love a Scotty by Ken Lane. And I've got a picture of, of Bailey at Christmas. Uh, I heard from the technicians that there's this wave of pets that just collapse right before the holidays. And so they just, they just fail. And so not our dogs. Our dogs, they love Christmas. They love presents under the tree. We give them their own stocking with bones and toys, and they live for it. They love to open packages and so they i think bailey got through the new year just for just for that because the doc said she wouldn't make it past thanksgiving but they don't know the heart of a scotty anyway this is uh, this is a poem that i wrote for bailey the cutest black dog ears and tail so proud heart of the largest shepherd loyalty uniquely scottish you may be gone from our sight even held tight in our heart the ultimate garden companion admiration of each planting hole go now run and play in the grass you loved chasing rabbits just behind butte's edge find love's release <sighs> as you enter final peace we will soon play again for that is the way of god to love and hold those so dear once again we miss you bailey a lot of you actually came into the nursery we've got dogs at free roam we got them a vest. They just greet and say hi to to the to visitors. Vincent was in all day this week, uh, saying hi. 
So you'll see that, but uh, thank you for your condolences and just being there for us. Okay, back on track. So yes, we do have a lot of garden information for you. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. (laughs) Did you know that plants can help you sleep better naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. And so welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. It's been a good garden week. We got a new uh, shrub in the backyard. Yeah. I don't and want to talk about I already about shared, that. I already shared, let everyone know what's going on. So, but we planted a, a Arizona rosewood. Our backyard's right. a total native. Mm-hmm. And so we went through and we always have memorial plants, if not full on gardens right. for pets or even people that we love. We just, uh-huh. we, we uh, plant a tree in memory and then we took Bailey's collar and we actually hung it. We've got a huge native juniper tree. Mm-hmm. And if you walk back there, you'll just see dog collars with their names <laughs> and stuff back there. And it's remember, it's a reminder yeah. for us that uh, right. Right. we we have a way of it's a memorial tree. Sometimes we we over complicate things. I had a friend of ours, they shot us a house plant. They yes, made a house yeah. plant and they wrapped, they glued around their the dog's collar plant. around the house plant container. Uh-huh. Yeah, brilliant. No, there's a lot of neat things you can do to have memorials for your pets. Yeah. And even your loved ones. Your, Absolutely. That can be done. It doesn't have to be a memorial. It can be a yeah. celebration. Like uh, your right. parents planted uh, trees for each kid that was yeah. that we had, grandkids. Right. They right. planted trees. So right. it was a, oh, yeah, I remember when you were born, we planted that uh, golden locust out yes. there when, uh, yeah, when you were just... <laughs> I remember my dad was, he was worried we'd be upset because he planted a crab apple for our first daughter. His <laughs> <laughs> she was kind of a cranky kid, you know. He just wanted a crab apple because it was a pretty tree. He goes, yeah. will you be upset if I plant a crab apple? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's very apropos. Yeah, Go ahead. Kinda, she was kind of one of those kids that was colicky. You know, some kids are just, they come out of the womb. Cranky. Crying, yeah. <laughs> She's driven though. She's really oh, doing yeah. well today. She's no, no, thirty no. now. She's so she's great. It's all great. But yeah. It's it's nice to be able to plant things like that in your yard as a memorial. And so this is about garden yeah. questions, oh, okay. right? We'll move so on to we'll we'll get to something happier. <laughs> well, we were unhappy. Birth births were good. Births so are this, happy. Okay. Yeah. Our first question is from Phil. He's in Prescott. He's actually up in the Groom Creek area, so a little colder than us. He wants to know, can he prune his grapes and blackberries um, now? And then his other question was, and I hope we have time for it, yeah. because it's confusing. Because some of them say first-year wood, some say second-year wood. How do you know which is which? So, yeah. Can you just cut yeah, it all question. back? We don't have time to go into that. It's a whole show by itself. We do have a fruit tree pruning class. We go deep into that. You have to come for hands-on display. But the bottom line is... Yes, right now, January, February, mid-March is when you prune back all of your brambles and your grapes. And there are techniques for each. I don't have time to expound upon every one of them. That's not an email question. That's a book encyclopedia (laughs) answer. But in a nutshell, what I do is 
The canes that were producing fruit last year, you want to cut out. I don't care if it's a first year, second year, you just, new canes produce better fruit. Mm -hmm. And so I usually, as I'm harvesting my blackberries or raspberries or boysenberries or the berries, I'll simply flag that cane, that vine, that going, oh yeah, that man, that one was a heavy producer. My goodness. I put a piece of bird tape or I put something on there, a string, mm -hmm. go, oh, that's the one I, I picked off of, and that's the one I cut off. So I have a visual reminder because you can't tell the midwinter. You can't tell what had same. berries. <laughs> yeah, they all look the same. Uh, so there's different techniques, but that's one that can mm -hmm. help you next year, not so much this year, mm -hmm. flag which ones are producing all the fruit. Because next year, the one that was just growing like crazy, that's the one that will be have all the fruit on it. And that's kind of how you prune brambles specifically. Okay. Grapes, you're just cutting back. You cut them all off. Cut everything off. <laughs> cut it back to the main stock. And it's kind of, you kind of yeah. start over. That's how you do that. So you said you were going to do a pruning class. I thought it was just fruit trees. Do you cover um, berries and that kind of thing in that class too? Or is that a separate class? Well, it depends on the where the class wants to go. Okay. But they always want to go to grapes and berries uh, uh, blueberries and fruit trees. So we'll cover some of that. Okay. Uh, depends on how deep the class, depends on who shows up. Okay. Could go anywhere. Okay. Next question is from June. She put in a time lawn last summer, uh, which we have a time lawn as yeah. well. She's concerned because she goes, eh, it looks a little rough right now. Yeah. Uh, will it come back? And she wants to know what she should be doing right now to help it through the winter. Water it. That's the main thing you can do now. I and mean, we've had a couple good storms. You want we've had one good storm per month kind of right now. So that's good. You should be watering a time lawn two times per month, a deep soak. With that, uh, that's that's all you really need to do right now. What what we do personally our, ourselves with our time lawn, and it's glorious, is we leave it cut real tall going into winter. That way all that foliage, that herbal evergreen thyme, typical herbal thyme, mm -hmm. protects itself so it doesn't have doesn't have to worry about it so much. Uh, usually about September or October, we'll put it in the highest setting. We'll just mow it real quick and then let it flush out. And you're really only mowing a thyme lawn twice a year, maybe, if you want to. What we'll do is, as soon as the cold is truly done, now we'll go down and we'll actually prune it. We'll actually cut it back probably mid-March or so. We'll fertilize it because we're going to encourage new growth. And what what I do is I'll take some broken bags of, of manure or topsoil or potting, whatever we have broken out there. <laughs> I put an organic layer mainly to level it out. Mm -hmm. So just to get it to where it grows. Um, herbal lawns grow a little differently than a grass, an actual mowing type of lawn. So it just levels it out, keeps things going, get some organics in there. But I use the all-purpose plant food. I level it off with some manures, typically, the barnyard, uh, the, the deodorized manure we have. And then you, you just prune it back in March or mow it in March, and mm -hmm. away you go. Right now, water it once a month. Right. If we get storms, twice yeah. a month if you have no storms. And it's okay if it looks a little rough right now. Well, yeah. Because it's, it's winter. winter. Yeah. yeah. They, a lot of your evergreens go off color. Your junipers mm -hmm. can get a more gray or purple hue. Yeah. Uh, your, your photinias gets kind of a yellow. Your... Your uh, cotoneasters get kind of a bluey, purpley looking. So it's okay for that. They'll green right up as soon as the days get a little bit longer. By in another month to a month and a half, you know, six to eight weeks, they are flushing out new growth and actively growing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Keith has a question. He's moved into a existing home, new for him. He's, there's beds and beds of iris. <laughs> yeah, <I've> heard <laughs> he this one before. Because <laughs> you don't think they've ever been dug or divided. He wants to know, can he dig them now and divide them and replant? Or should he wait? What's your advice? Yeah. Generally with iris. Now, here I'm quoting the book, and then there's reality. You want to do it now. Uh, reality, the book says, uh, reset the beds in fall. So right. August, September, October, sometime in the fall. You pull all those bulbs, the rhizomes out, the bulbs, the roots, and then you reset them. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't get it done. You just moved in. Fine. Do it now. You'll still be fine because iris in the mountains of Arizona grow 
so thick that they start to choke each other out. Mm. They just won't bloom very well. So you should be replanting an iris bed, pulling all the iris up and resetting them probably every other to every third year. Oh, really? Uh, if you really want pretty flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they get wimpy. They overgrow each other. They mm -hmm. choke each other out. The, sm the flowers are smaller, mm -hmm. less flowers. You can reinvigorate simply by dig them out. You'll pick the strongest, largest, thickest rhizomes, the biggest, fleshiest roots. You're going to take those and reset them at about, oh, every 6, 8, 12 inches. Whatever you think feels right, that's good enough. Reset them, and then you're going to backfill with some organic, rich soil. Not manures. You're going to take some potting soil or some mulch with some soil and backfill over about 4 to 6 inches. Mm -hmm. Just lightly cover each of those rhizomes. Fertilize with all-purpose plant food. I would also add some bone meal at mm -hmm. the same time because that's 0, 10, 0. That's phosphorus. It creates more in flowers the soil. in, in the soil. Mm -hmm. And then water it. You're set. You'll get spectacular flowers. You'll still have more rhizomes, more of those roots, than mm -hmm. you know what to do with. Give them plant, away. <laughs> plant another bed. Give them away. Throw them some away. away. <laughs> if they're weak and spindly, you don't want those yeah. anyway. Should you so, cut them back? If you haven't cut them back yet, should you do that before? So I went ahead and took the lawnmower over top of our okay. beds that were already there. And so they're just cut back. Okay. So yeah, I, you should get rid of the old spent flowers and, and then fertilize and they'll flush out with brand new growth. Good questions this week, folks. Be right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is well pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, always good to hear your garden questions. Uh, let, let's set the stage here. So wildflowers, I want you to be an expert on how to choose the right variety and how to plant wildflowers in your backyard. They are very easy to grow. The higher elevations of the mountains of Arizona are famous for our wildflowers. Whole hillsides will turn to California poppies and verbena and just this wave of echinaceas and lupins and asters. And there's just this wave of, of flowers. And this could be, if we keep getting a few more storms like we've had, this could be an exceptional year for wildflowers. Let me go over what to choose and how to choose the right seed in this segment because it's a shorter segment. And then we'll have Lisa in with her her take on, on flowers, on gardening. And then I'll spend a whole 10 minutes on just how to get a, a wildflower bed ready. It seem, seem reasonable. So we'll, two segments broken up by Lisa just because otherwise you might check out on me and get bored and change the channel. We don't want that. So how to choose the right seed though, there is a tremendous difference in quality and how to choose quality. But the seed are so small, how do you choose? How do you know what is good, good, good quality or not? Did you know they actually rate seeds? There's computers and lasers and uh, scales, and they'll actually screen and filter out seed, even the tiniest of seed. So if you've got a grade A, grade B, grade C, and then the dust and the leftover the, that they sweep up on the floor and then package for 10 for a dollar. Hey, you want some? 
And so you never quite know what you're going to get or the quality you're going to get. You really want a grade A quality native seed mix, a blend of seed, so that you have this wave of flowers coming up at you that are right for the area. That's what you're looking for. Uh, now, a lot of seed packages, especially really pretty glossy, uh, the pretty packages I find are mainly filled with annual flowers. Annuals come up by seed and bloom once and they're done. Perennials will come up by seed, bloom, and then it dies back to the ground like in midwinter. And then it will come back, that same exact plant, the same DNA will come back from the same root back. It will emerge fresh from the ground and come back up. Then it will reseed and start spreading throughout the yard. You really want perennial seed varieties in your mix. And then you don't want just one pure seed. What happens is we'll, if, you, if you have a monoculture, is what they call that, one variety of plant in your garden if you get a disease goes through, or if the vermin, the, let's say the rabbits decide, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Let's all invite friends, come over, and just eat, mow down this grass, uh, wildflower, meadow mix blend. Let's go after this. You, you're committing to just one variety. Uh, the beauty of a blend is if one variety in that, you've got 12, 15, 20 different varieties of flowers in this blend, if you do have a disease that goes through one variety, you've got all the other 19 varieties still there that, that weren't influenced by the rabbits or the disease or grubs or mildew, whatever it is. So it's good to have a blend always, even in your yard, uh, for shrubs, for trees, for, but especially with wildflowers. You want to make sure that they're perennials, so they'll come back every year. And you want to make sure they're right for this area, or you just might be a slave to watering all the time because you've got a Rocky Mountain variety or East Coast variety that takes more water. So yes, you can grow it here, but it will require more water. Or you've got a desert variety and it doesn't ever come up because we never quite get warm enough. You know, certain seed would prefer Phoenix 100 degrees or more. Well, we just don't get that up in the mountains of Arizona. Uh, not, not very often. And when we do, we're tortured by it. So you want to have a blend that's right for the mountains. That's what you're looking for. Uh, we, we go with a company called Beauty Beyond Belief. It's a great local company. They collect seed out in the wild. They come back, bring it, and we've got our own custom blends. I've actually make, I like flowers and seed, and I like making certain custom blends. And we've got a, a hummingbird and butterfly mix, pollinator mix, an Arizona mix. We have a, a deer and rabbit resistive mix. We've got four different mixes we made just for us, for here, for the central highlands area. It would work in the White Mountains. It'd work in Kingman. It'd work in Payson. But we're located here, and so we made it for right here. But in the mountains of Arizona, it's going to work really well. You buy it by the pound, and, and a, about a quarter cup goes about 100 square feet. Uh, so now you've got to figure out how much, what is my garden space, so you get the right amount of seed, that right amount of mix. What I do, what I, how I started creating my own mixes, I've done wildflower patches for years, is I'll usually take a mix that's just generic, over the counter, and then I'll, I, like, my theme this year is going to be purple. I want more purple flowers, whether it's annual petunias or salvias, whatever it is, I want more purple. So I'll generally like a theme. So then I'll take the individual seed mixes. So if I wanted more purple in this native generic seed mix, I'll take a few individual seeds, let's say purple verbena, and I'll actually custom make my own. I'll add that to this blend I just bought. So I've skewed that color towards purple. I, hopefully I'm describing that correctly over the airwaves. So I make my own personal. You won't see this blend anywhere else except in my backyard. So I customize it. If you like poppies, Add more poppies to that mix. So customize it that way. I'll go in exactly how to put it in the ground or on the ground and when after we have Lisa Watersling coming in the studio. Be right back, though, with a lot of garden tips, tricks, and advice. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. 
brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. And back in the studio, we've got Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week and just shares her her take on gardening, her her seasonality, her flair, her colors. And so we want to get that perspective, another gardener's perspective on that. And so Lisa comes each week and shares whatever is top of mind for you. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Glad you're here. Yeah. Good to be here. So this week, I thought we would talk about, I know it's kind of uh, getting to that time of year, where people are looking ahead and thinking what they want to put in their yards and grow and that type of thing. I thought, uh, we do always talk about fruit trees quite a bit, but I thought we would talk about edibles that are not fruit trees, but still can be used in the yard and they can be used in your landscape. Okay. So I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, I'll plant a raspberry, but you know, I have to have all this special structure and blah, blah, blah. And, but you can use them right in your landscape um, and they can add, you know, you get the food off of them, the birds get to enjoy them and you get to use them in your landscape as well. We've always had grapes. We use mm-hmm. grapes for up posts over arbors. We've had full on gazebos with grapes going over a story and a half deck where mm-hmm. grapes are dropping down through. So we use blackberries now to soften up a six foot cedar mm-hmm. fence just because I mean a fence is pretty actually ugly. a fence is ugly. <laughs> fence is ugly no matter what. Unless it's got the, the some softening yeah. or some foliage and then it feels like a secret garden, like mm-hmm. it's this living, breathing right. room that you're in. Mm-hmm. So we use a lot of edibles. Oh, definitely. So I thought we'd start with um, some of the blueberries. Yeah, good. There are a couple of blueberries that I really like. One is called peach sorbet. And we Blueberries do excellent planted in containers, so they're nice to use as containers uh, on your decks, your patios, by your front doors. Peach sorbet actually stays evergreen. That's right. But the evergreen yeah. on it is kind of a more of a fall color, kind of a burgundy, pink to burgundy color. Yeah. So it's, you're getting more than just one season out of it because you're getting the blossoms in the spring, you're getting the blueberries, and then you're getting that beautiful fall winter color. Uh, so that's one I really, really like to use in containers. Making my mouth water. <laughs> just a blueberry picked fresh off the vine is yeah. so much better. I mean, you'll never, you just won't enjoy blueberries again until yeah. you pick, once you pick them fresh, they like melt. They're like little blue bubbles that pop in your mouth. It's just sweet bursts of blue. Yeah. Whereas in the, in the store, it's more pulpy, less sugary. Yeah, There's something not the it. same. Flavorless, almost. Kind of, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they taste good, but not like fresh. Oh, my right. gosh. But just so easy to grow in containers. So yeah. that's a nice pretty one plant. to have. The other one that's really pretty is called pink icing, which is another a very attractive. The thing I like about blueberries, too, they get, what, two, three feet at the most? Yeah. Um, so they're going to look attractive in those pots. They're not going to outgrow the pots. They're shapely. And Right, and they, they have that their nice form. round shape to them, yeah. and they don't require a lot of pruning, do they? You're just no, kind of shaping well, it's them. a haircut, and that's it. In mm-hmm. a container, virtually no pruning. It's just mm-hmm. so easy. And when the grandkids come over, <laughs> I mean, Joshua and I were we were like picking like crazy, just blueberries until his face is just covered in blue. Right, uh, it was perfect. They just think that's like heaven. It is heaven. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, blueberries, excellent to use. Berries, like you said before, of any kind. You can use um, blackberries, raspberries, uh, boysenberries, all of those. And they grow quite well here. Um, One of the berries that I like, so in blackberries, they're coming out with, you have your old standard bin forever varieties. They come up with some new varieties. I don't 
think it matters too much which ones you pick. They're all you? the same. No, I know there's uh, kind of like the idea of the thornless ones, um, you know, black satin or the Chester thornless, or there's a thornless boysenberry. Yeah, um, that way you're not getting poked all the time. <laughs> Close to a, where you're entertaining, yes. Mm-hmm. So we've got a blackberry planted where the pond, the wall comes in close to the fence. You can walk in between those two and there's a blackberry kind of, mm-hmm. you brush up against it. There's no way around right. it. And it's so aggressive. I planted a thornless variety. Mm-hmm. So if I make a mistake or if the kids kind of face plant face first, they're not going to look like they came out in a, yeah. a cat fight. Right. Uh, further down, I would rather use a big gym. Or is it prime gym? Prime gym. Prime gym. Mm-hmm. Cause so many folks, which, which cane do I prune? Right. Which one do I not prune? Prime gym prunes twice uh-huh. on the new wood and the second year wood. So it's, right. you can't, you, you can't, can't make lose. a mistake. <laughs> and it's still those great big black berries. Uh-huh. So there's new varieties coming out. Yeah. All the time. So you mentioned they do really well, uh, like we have ours on a fence. You probably, you couldn't use them on an arbor. Am I correct in that? I I mean, you could, although they're more of a bramble, Mm -hmm. not a vine. So typically on an arbor or a trellis, some of those we're using a vine. So you weave Mm -hmm. that honeysuckle or clematis or wisteria up through the vine and and overtakes that. A grape is more of a vine than it is a bramble. Mm -hmm. A bramble puts on a cane and then you trim them differently. So that cane doesn't live for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. It lives for a year or two, and then right. it dies back. Well, well, if you've trained it in between the arbor, it Not gets so a good. little awkward. It doesn't look as right. good, so it's harder to maintain. Yeah. You could do it. It's just harder to maintain. Definitely there are better, better choices. Fences or trellises, yeah. that type of thing. So we use a six-foot fence and tie it up against the mm-hmm. fence. And We have a trellis. I just linked up against the fence. We tie it to that just as a way to keep it out of the way. Right. Otherwise, brambles tend to ramble they get in the way sometimes. Right. I want it flat up against the wall and just stay there. And, and I'll they harvest have, later. They have come out with a more of a shrub variety, oh, yeah. like the shortcake varieties, so usually raspberries. Um, so definitely more of a shrub form, so you don't have to worry about having a lot of space for them to grow. We're trying to develop more and more dwarf varieties, low maintenance varieties. You plant them once, you're done. You don't have to have be, be a slave to pruning every year or every month some of these varieties. Mm-hmm. It's just once. And with the yards getting smaller and smaller, well, now we can have it just off the patio or yeah. in a large pot. Mm-hmm. You have this beautiful blackberry. There's a dwarf variety, beautiful fruit trees, dwarf varieties that are close by, but they still produce the same size fruit. The right. fruits aren't dwarf. Mm-hmm. Just the plant is dwarfed, but it it puts on the same size fruit. It's a great way to go. Oh, yeah, definitely. The other thing I learned, and I did not know this, uh, with raspberries, it's almost like strawberries. There's some that are ever-bearing. They call them ever-bearing. There's some that produce, they call it midsummer or summer, late summer. Um, And I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it's kind of like if you want jams, you Mm -hmm. want we want everything to come off all at once, so you can go in the kitchen and process all your jellies and jams. But if you want to eat them for breakfast, you want one that ever bears, so they don't little waves of fruit all Mm -hmm. the time pulsating off these vines. Yeah, yeah. So fall gold, which is one of my favorite raspberries, is an ever bearing one, so it's always going to be producing. And the color on that truly is a gold raspberry. Very pretty. People kind of look at it and go, but you got to taste one. Oh my gosh, they are amazing. So definitely try those. Some that are a little bit different is your gooseberry and your currants. Um, And I think those probably do better in the ground, would you say? Yeah. I mean, they can grow. It's a big shrub, Mm -hmm. but currants grow wild in the mountains. So you'll see those kind of thorny, Mm -hmm. little red berry, gold berry. There's different varieties. And gooseberry is kind of an Mm old-fashioned type of plant. It's kind of right up there with Oregon grape. Or, right. or Mahonia. Your, those little blueberries or currants, your grandparents used to use them all the time. Mm-hmm. They go out in the wild and harvest these wild currants or wild... Right. Uh, um, Usually used it, for jellies yeah. and baking. Yep. And that kind of, not so much for just eating right off of the plant. Although they're pretty good that way. The birds yeah. love them that way. Yeah, you gooseberries like virgin. pop in your mouth. It's kind of like a persimmon looking thing. It's super <laughs> sweet and then tart and your mouth, it's like a cacophony of like explosion in your mouth all at the same time where you don't your mouth taste but didn't know what to do with it all and of course there's grapes and there's tons of varieties of grapes they all seem to do really really well here we seem to have a good location for it and the other thing about all those guys is they are all self-fertile so it's not like you got to 
plant you can have just one raspberry you don't have to plant two different varieties or one grape you know and and so you it's easy to grow those especially in a smaller yard i would agree and they like clay soil Mm -hmm. the main thing is they like a rich soil so when you're planting those i notice they take a little bit more fertilizing so i fertilize about every other month or so with the all-purpose food it's an organic, so slowly uh, feeds these things over and over. And I find I get bigger or more uh, produce coming off of these. And then when you plant them, probably take the extra leftover in the bag and just top dress. Mm-hmm. They'll like that extra nutrients that you right. gave them in the, in the ground. All right, great. Edibles in the mountains of Arizona. You can have beauty and eat it too here at Waters Garden Center. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on shop, and choose personal garden shopper. A waters garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The personal garden shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to go how to actually put wildflowers how to start a patch in your own backyard. Whether you're on a a tiny postage stamp backyard, you can have a portion of that be wildflowers. And they'll come up in waves of color. Wildflowers don't bloom all at the same time. Uh, The poppies will bloom for about a month. And then the verbena will bloom about a month. And the Mexican primrose will bloom about a month. And so if you get the right blend, you'll have this tremendously long period of flowers that rotate through seasonally all the way through the end of the year when you're ending with asters and mums, those types of plants. So get the right mix. We already covered that. This is exactly how you put it in the ground. The biggest mistake I find people make is they plant at the wrong time. They're coming to the nurseries when it's spring. So it's May, June, July. They want they want flowers. They want to start wild flowers though. And I'll have those. They're started. They're rooted. They're in bloom. But to start it by seed, most wildflowers need this freeze and thaw cycle to properly germinate, especially some of the larger flowers, the echinaceas, the the, the coreopsis, the poppies. They need this freeze and thaw to scarify or to crack open that hull so the seed can find its way out. If you wait until May, June, July, we're done with frost. So they need to be in this, 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 this cold cycle. So timing's everything. This is the window. Now through, I would say, the end of March or so, February, if you can get that, it's even better. So you have a better germination rate. The second thing is people expect to be able to throw seed out in their yard, just kind of sprinkle it like fairy dust, and, and flowers will just come up. Through, through through under the pine trees and in between all the weeds and the grasses and over the hills and that slope that's 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 washing away I'll put wallflowers down that's not the way it works I know that's how it works in nature but how it works you're paying like 6 7 bucks a pound for uh, for this this seed, it's very expensive seed. It's more expensive than beans or tomato seed or radishes. This is more a good seed's going to cost a little more. You want every single seed to germinate. If you just throw it out there like nature does it, well, nature throws out millions of seed, you know, and 10,000 of them come up. And we see those. You don't see the other 999,000 and whatever that is left over that didn't germinate or that sit there and wait to germinate when the seasons are just right. By doing a few key steps, you can have every single seed come up. The secret is to know where your plot is. It needs about six hours of sun would be ideal. 
Now, there are some shade mixes, but most of us in the mountains, we mainly deal with sunny locations, even underneath a pine tree. That's considered really full sun because that morning sun comes and hits that soil underneath. It gets some midday break as the foliage from that tree uh, protects it. And then at the end of the day, you get some more sun. So if you have six hours or more of sun, that is considered full sun in the mountains of Arizona. So I'll, I'll just go over that. Find that area, preferably with six hours or more of sun, and then rake it out. Get all the, the, the debris, the roots, the weeds, the, the rocks, uh, construction material. Just get rid of all that stuff. So take a stiff time rake and just rake off that area. You're doing two things, getting rid of the junk that's on top of the soil. Second, you're opening up that seed bed to receive the seed better. So you open up the soil so it takes in that seed so you get a better soil to seed contact. You'll increase your germination rate that way. Now you're not turning it like you would a regular garden bed. You're not taking a shovel and turning to one shovel's depth and adding organics. You're not, you're not doing any of that. You're simply raking open and opening up the ground and getting rid of the junk. That's what that's how you prepare. Then you want to spread your seed. Now some of these seeds are so small you can't you can't once you spread them out you can't see where they land. So I've, I, for myself, just so I can see where that seed went, I actually have a wheelbarrow whenever I start a seed bed. And I'll take a bag of Waters Premium Mulch. We've screened that down real tight. It's like a seedling mix. And I'll dump that into the wheelbarrow. And then I'll take my seed that I bought for that, that amount of square footage, and I dump that into that mulch wheelbarrow area. And I turn all that together. And so I'm, now I'm spreading not just the seed, I've actually created my own hydro mulch. I'm spreading that mulch and seed mix over top of that seed bed I just raked up, raked out, opened up. And so now I can see where the seed are going. It also does a couple other real key benefits. Birds are, have ferocious appetites in the middle of winter. And so it keeps the bird, it hides that seed so the birds have to really work. It, I mean, struggle to even find one seed. So it hides that seed from the birds. So more seed will germinate. They're left there to germinate. Second, it increases my seed to soil contact. So now I've, got, I've opened the earth up. I've blended my seed with some mulch. And then I'm spreading that over that opened up earth. And so I've got some real significant seed to soil contact. So I get better germination. Every single seed are going to come up when I do that. And so create your own hydro mulch, whatever that looks like. I would say do not use wood chips. That's detrimental to seed beds. Uh, you want to use a composted material. Do not use manure. That's going to burn as seedlings start to germinate. That new taproot will just burn right off with manure. You want to use compost. So be I'm very specific with, with what I would say, don't use just any kind of mulch. Come in and get a bag of Waters Premium Mulch. It's screened down real tight. It's composted. You'll get a better germination rate. You'll, get a, you'll have a better garden. So just, just be wary. Don't use manure. Don't use wood chips. Okay. With that, I'm spreading that out. Then what I'll do is I'll take my, my, my rake and I'll turn it with the tines pointing straight up. And I'll just scooch that back and forth across that seed bed. It just, again, it just scuffs up the soil. So I'm trying to get that seed down into the soil. If you were to simply chuck the seed on top of the seed bed without raking, without adding mulch or anything else, you would have a few flowers come up. Very few. By taking this little extra step, easy steps, you, you dramatically increase your success rate. I mean, it goes from brown thumb to, I'm not sure if I did this right, to, oh my gosh, this really worked. And now you can share that advice with your friends and neighbors, and they'll think you're the greatest gardener ever. That's the secret. A few little extra steps make a difference. Now, I add two things on top of that seed bed. When I'm all done, I've spread it out. I've taken my stiff tine rake. I've scooched that around just to scuff up the soil so that the garden bed actually receives that seed better. I will spread a fertilizer on top of that seed bed, I use the all-purpose, 744 all-purpose food. It's a natural food, safe for pets, safe for birds, safe for all that kind of stuff. And, and I'll water that in. As a good thing about an organic food is as, as that 
seed bed comes up, as it rotates, as it flowers, as the moisture comes, as more snow and water and rain comes, it releases a little food every single time it comes in contact with moisture over the next three, four months. This is perfect because this is when the seed are going to germinate. In addition to that, I also add, I said two things, food, and I also add soil activator. Uh, I think they now call it humic. It's humic acid, basically. Uh, for seeds, for seedlings, you want things to root out. You want them to grow deeper, dark, uh, larger root mass. Soil activator, or humic acid, really increases, kind of tickles the feet so that it wants to root down deeper into the soil. Well, that's perfect. If you're going to add a seed bed out there for lawns, for wildflower seeds, for, for vegetable seeds, anytime you're putting seed or, or want more root growth, new plants out in the yard, I use soil activator. It encourages deeper, larger roots. So I, I'll have a better patch of wildflowers that blooms longer. I'll spread that out at the recommended rate over the seed bed. I water it all in. The next question comes, well, which one do you do first? Is it the food or is it the soil activator? Is it the seed? It absolutely makes zero difference. Just put the seed down at some point, put the food down at some point, put the soil activator down at some point, you're good to go. You're watering probably every couple of weeks. If you get a nice storm system, you're probably good to go. So keep the seed bed moist. Don't let it dry out bone dry. But things don't dry out very quickly this time of year. That's the beauty of planting wildflowers this time of year. So with that, I've got a handout. I just read all of this off of this um, garden talk on planting wildflowers. It's free. Every time you plant wildflowers from us, you get one of these. Uh, come in. If you, if you bought your wildflowers from somewhere else, come in. Get a free copy of this. We want you to be successful. We want more wildflowers to be planted in the mountains of Arizona. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love Victory Gardens, they love to shop. Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Roman Beauty Roseberry. This Mediterranean beauty has graceful, arching branches that flow over rock walls, raised beds, or container's edge. A culinary herb often used in potpourri. Rugged, deer-resistive, evergreen, likes crummy soil, drought, and abuse. Now that's my kind of shrub for under $36. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love unusual, healthy herbs, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now, I am finishing up the pruning in my backyard. So, I've, as I've gone through pruning perennials, shrubs, natives, trees, fruit trees, I've been making some notes on, on what I am personally doing. How do I approach uh, a pear tree planted in a container. Uh, I've got that. It's a fairly substantial tree in a large pot on the back patio. How did I approach pruning that and the size? I thought I would share that and go real deep into how to actually prune next week. Your timing should be perfect for pruning. So you've got now through middle of March, you got two months, you know, seven, eight weeks or so to really get your pruning done for the year. This harder, this, this mid-winter pruning. So the book says you should prune between January 1 and March 15. That's the window. So we're right in the middle of that. We'll go out. I'll share my tips, how I was approaching that, and what we're going to teach the class uh, next week. On, on No, next week is wildflowers. Week after that. First week in, in February is pruning uh, demonstrations. So this week we covered the class. Every Saturday we have a free garden class at 930 here at Waters Garden Center. You're welcome to come. 
Um, this week it was houseplants. How do you have healthy houseplants? How do you have them grow for years to come rather than just an orchid that lives for six weeks and then you throw it away and get a new one? This We wanted people to be experts with houseplants, but this is houseplant season. This is when most we see a tremendous spike in our sales of houseplants. So that's why we had the class then. Next week, we've got, uh, what is that, the 26th? We've got wildflowers. It's your time to put wildflowers in. We'll go over all what I just explained this show and with hands-on demonstrations. You can touch and feel the seed. We'll have extra experts on. We bulk up on wildflower seeds just for the class. And so we'll have that. The week after that, we go over pruning. So how do you, in fact, I've, I've invited... Um, uh, Johnny Schaefer with, with Johnny's Tree and Landscape Service to come in, and he's a certified arborist. He's going to teach that class for us. That's the first week in, in first Saturday in February. So each week, it's something that rotates through, and it's very timely, seasonally correct. And hopefully, most folks are thinking about that topic at that time so we can up your game in your own backyard. That That is our goal every single week, to make you better gardeners. They're free. They're meant to be. Uh, just just to make you better. And we're thinking if you teach someone how to garden, they're going to come back and, and use you as their garden center. And that's, that's worked for us for decades. This is our 57th year being open, 57th spring that Waters Garden Center has been around. Uh, Lisa's father uh, started that process many decades ago. And he just teach someone how to garden. They'll respect you for that. And they'll, the, most of them will support you and come back and tell their friends. And that's that word of mouth in small towns especially. Word of mouth is everything. And so that has worked for us. And so we have no intention of changing it. That's the reason for the garden, uh, the podcast, the garden show, the garden columns, the magazines. is helping people, helping them work in their own backyards, not, not promoting or advertising. Just give them some tips that really work make a difference in their own backyard that, that season. That's what we're after. And so, But throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Come and visit. We always have horticulturalists on staff whenever we're open. Uh, all of this information is available on our website, watersgardencenter.com. And we post regularly on Facebook, uh, our page. There's like 85, 8,700 followers. It's crazy. Now follow us, Water, Facebook forward slash Facebook. Waters Garden Center, hit the follow button, and then you'll see the feed or garden content that's coming up. It's meant to be non-political, just fun, a relief, an unplugging from everyday life, and just meant meditate in the gardens. That's what we want. Ken Elisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners, until next week, may your gardens be more prosperous than ever in 2019. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, oh, man! Another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.